Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is none other than Nick Hughes, international man of mystery, Krav Maga instructor, author of How to Be Your Own Bodyguard. Hello, Mr. Hughes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, mate. Glad to be here. (laughs) And I don't think a lot of our viewers need to know how excited I am about having you on the show finally. I must have given the advice about keeping old shoes in your car that I got from this here book a dozen times in my episodes in my blog posts, because it's just one of those, I, you never think of it. And then you hear it and you go, yeah, I should have been doing that all along. I will do that starting now for the rest of my life. And that kind of uh, very specific knowledge in the protection field only comes from real professionals. And so I think what I'd like to start by just, could you tell the audience a little bit about your background in protection services, in martial arts, you had some military experience and you've worked with, but not for some law enforcement as well, if I understand correctly. Yeah, uh, so starting at the beginning, I got into martial arts in school Mm -hmm. back in the late 60s. So this was Mm pre-Bruce Lee, no one knew what the hell it was. Um, Bruce Lee hit in about, I think, 73, 74, we had the movie Five Fingers of Death. And, you know, if you were around in those days, you know, this became the biggest fad in the world. It wasn't like yo-yos and skateboards where kids did it. Everybody did it. Worldwide phenomenon. And uh, I already had a head start on the others. And I ended up in a karate style that was involved in security, uh, practical applications of martial arts. They didn't pursue the tournament route at all. And most of the black belts worked in nightclubs. They were bouncers. And then we ended up due to that side of the business. One of the promoters in Australia said, could you do the crowd control for us at our rock concerts? And he was bringing in Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, David Bowie, ABBA, uh, Fleetwood Mac, everybody. We've still got guys bodyguarding those people to this day. Mm. And I got fascinated in that whole protection field because I had been bullied at school. You do martial arts, you learn to take care of yourself. Then you take care of people around you. And then all of a sudden, someone wants to pay you to take care of their people. And I wanted to end up being a bodyguard. And in Australia, the problem was our prime minister at the time, we'd never had a terrorist incident in the country. So our prime minister had an old retired cop was his security who had a wheel gun. And we didn't take it seriously. And everybody told me, dude, you want to do that? You're going to have to be in Europe or America. And my grandparents are English, so I could go over there much easier than getting into the States. And that's what I did. But when I landed in England, black belt in hand, ready to save them all, they just laughed. And they said, mate, we use ex-special forces which is genius because the government's already vetted you. Uh, You've learned, you know, you've proven that you can work as part of a team. You can take orders. You're used to standing around for long periods of time doing nothing. You've learned how to handle weapons. You've probably rolled through Northern Ireland and had some shots taken at you and not panicked and dealt with bombs and all that stuff. You've learned first aid. So you pretty much got all your training done for you apart from some very specific bodyguard related stuff. And I went off and joined the French Foreign Legion to get that special forces training and came out and started work. And I worked in 21 countries. And while I was doing the bodyguard training, it struck me all the martial arts we'd learned was the fight started, right? So the guy's coming at you with a knife. There's two of them. He's grabbed you in a headlock. What do you do? Bodyguarding is all about uh, awareness of what can happen and avoidance. So if I'm taking a client to Russia, you know, we'll start scanning newspaper reports. We'll talk to our connections over there. We'll reach out to the embassy. We find out what's going on, who's being targeted. Are they up for kidnapping, assassination, whatever? And then we work a plan uh, to avoid falling afoul of those people or running into any problems. And I'm looking at it. So it starts with, you know, selection of the target and then isolation of the target and so on. I'm looking at all of these steps going, how come nobody's teaching this? in self-defense fields. Why are we always starting where the fight starts instead of the 75%, which we call soft skills. And uh, I decided to put it into a book because the thing that struck me, I'd be talking to people and they're like, well, that's nice, but who the hell can afford a bodyguard and who can help, who the hell can afford the training? Uh, The training now it's become more prolific with all the guys coming back from overseas. 
Uh, but back in the day, like when I went in Europe, there was only one school in Europe called CQB Services run by ex-SAS guys uh, and a friend of mine, Dennis Martin. Mm -hmm. And we went through that training and the whole time I'm like, man, civilians can't afford this. They don't know this stuff. And that's where the book came up from. And that's right. And, you know, if right away, that's reflected in the book where mm -hmm. this bookmark right here is about where you start talking about the kicking and the punching and the shooting and the stabbing. Yeah. Yeah. And this whole part is all the things you do to avoid having to use the parts right here. Uh -huh. you know, you know, the nice point. I never thought of that. I should show that to people at my intro class because I talk about the 75%, but I can prove it in the book. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a new edition of this book coming out very soon, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, hopefully. I, it would have been out this week, but uh, my, it turns out my book formatter didn't know it was a nonfiction and uh, she doesn't do nonfiction because of the indexing. It's a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. So I have to find another format. A second that's out, the new one is up. It's got about 90 more pages of information mm -hmm. because we have to update all the time. Like when the original version of the book came out, there was no such thing as Uber. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist. So there was a section in there on security and taxi cabs, but nothing at all with Uber. And Uber has some very specific problems associated with mm -hmm. it. For both and some very specific solutions, which yeah, you also might... Yeah, and it was for drivers uh, and passengers, not, not just one yeah. or the other. So uh, we updated, yeah. and then it was due for another update. We've had all this unrest. There's been riot, a lot more rioting than we've ever seen. FBI's just reported that violent crime's gone up 30% nationwide, not just in big cities, and that's the largest increase in over 100 years. Yeah, uh, This is since all this defunding of the cops and so on. So, yeah, it's it was due for an update, and that's what's happening. And I was fortunate enough to be one of your beta readers on that. And uh, mm -hmm. if we don't mind some spoilers, one of the things I really appreciated was you directly addressed simple physical fitness as a self-defense skill. Yeah, which, and I did. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's a, that is a point that I think is absolutely on the nose, but is missed in a lot of the conversation about self-defense and personal safety. Yeah, and I missed it the first time round, and I should have picked up on it because I'm always talking about, you know, martial arts, traditionally, a lot of people forget this, and it was a Tai Chi instructor who taught me, martial arts is actually about health more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Because if someone's trying to split your head open with a baseball bat, and you're learning to stop that from happening, you are preserving your health. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you look at special forces, you look at bodyguard training, secret service and all that stuff. And those guys have to be fit. You have no business being in that line of work. If you can't pick your client up, throw him over your shoulder and run 90 yards with him. And then I started looking at people with self-defense. We're also, if we're you know, talking about COVID, they've just released this massive study that they're now finding out all the fatalities, all of the people going to ICU, uh, most of the people dying are obese. And America mm -hmm. leads the world in our levels of obesity. And you talk about self-defense. And, and I mentioned that in the first book, right? I run into these guys at gun schools who are 400 pounds. And they, they're worried about being attacked by someone and they're learning how to shoot. And I'm like, dude, you're going to drop dead from a self-inflicted heart attack or a stroke mm -hmm. before you ever get attacked by anybody. But they lose sight of that. And they're always looking for bad guys around the corner, not realizing they're killing them. Absolutely. I um, you know, my first martial arts instructor was my middle school wrestling coach. Uh, yeah. But my first self-defense instructor was my track coach in grade school. Right. And at that time, it was about avoiding injury through rapid flight, which is still something I recommend and mm -hmm. prefer to put hands on a day of the week. But yep. as I'm getting to, you know, I'm turning 50 this year. It's a middle class, middle aged guy lives in the suburbs. Getting that road work in, doing that, that running is going to protect me yeah. from more likely hazards than all the, all the range time I can put together. Yeah, exactly right. There's another thing with bodyguarding. People forget sell, uh, first aid. And we used to tell, because I went back on those schools as an instructor, and I used to tell the guys, you are going to, in this industry, use your first aid skills probably once or twice a year. You will probably never pull your weapon because we're looking after rich old guys predominantly, right? They have a heart attack on the golf course. You're not shooting anybody. You're trying to keep that guy alive until the, the professionals get there. And that's true. And as a, board. and as a, as a parent for the viewers of the show, that's equally true, even more true. Mm -hmm. I mean, m the overwhelming majority of childhoods get all the way to adulthood without ever having a serious assault or a serious violent altercation. Exactly. I'm not aware of a childhood that doesn't end with a trip to the ER 
or a serious <laughs> or stitches. I mean, if you make it yeah. to 18 without stitches and or a broken arm, somebody screwed up, honestly. Yeah, you haven't had much of a childhood. <laughs> you know, and so and that gets right back into as parents who this this whole project of mine started kind of as I, you know, by the time I had my first kid, I was fourth Don in Kempo Karate, high school wrestler, done some very, very low key bodyguard work, done a, a lot of bouncing, I did the black belt bouncing thing. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I thought I was a badass, but then my, my first son, we adopted at age seven. And I realized that virtually none of my training had prepared me to protect this other person for whom I was now responsible. Yep. And so I started looking at, you know, the, the bodyguard training and the idea yep. that parents, a parent should consider themselves a bodyguard for their kids and for yep. each other. Yep. Great Absolutely. way to look at it. And that the reminder that that includes, you know, good fitness, some mm-hmm. martial arts training, some range training, if you decide to be a gun person. And to be clear, if you decide to be a gun person, that is deciding to get trained on that gun or you're just becoming a part of the problem. Yeah, but also first aid and getting real first aid training beyond the, you know, the half day thing your boss made you take so they could get a break on their insurance. Right. Yeah. And I, and one of the, you asked me to come up with, you know, 10 or 15 talking points today. One of them was going to be on first aid because I've gone through a guy called Greg Elifritz as a genius, does a really good Mm. tactical medical course. And he's talking about simple things like, I think it was Puerto Rico or Bahamas or somewhere got hit by a hurricane a couple of years ago. And their hospital was wiped out. The roads were like devastated. You couldn't get from where you live to any sort of medical treatment for months. Mm. Uh, FEMA hadn't arrived yet with any any sort of medical, they bring those trailers in, you know, they drop them and they're like mobile field units for like mass units in the military and they didn't have anything now and what is the likelihood that your kid is going to be cut by flying debris walk outside stand on a nail a window blows in in the house and he gets cut with glass uh if that starts an infection where do you get penicillin from how do you administer this stuff how do you put stitches in and most people are oblivious because we live for the most part uh, what we call the golden hour, that if something happens to your kid in his backyard, within 60 minutes, he's at the local ER being patched up. But there are times, and that's what you have to be prepared for, right? You could be out hiking um, 50 miles from anywhere on a trail four miles deep and your kid falls down a rock and breaks his collarbone or slices his arm open. you got no cell phone service. You better start knowing how to take care of him or you're screwed. And it's just simple things like that. And there are courses that cover it. I mean, Wilderness First Responder is brilliant. It's two weeks long and you'll do bone setting and putting in stitches and all that stuff, which, you know, like you said, your your, your four-hour Red Cross, it's a great place to start, uh, but you definitely want to get something a little bit more significant than that. I'd also want to put a plug in for the the Stop the Bleed training. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I think it's a brand name, but it's a really quick arterial bleeding response yep. class it's a a day or two depending how you do it yep yeah there's some great guys great guys out there now and this is another big benefit of the push for the the prepper crowd because now it's created this market so lone star medical out of texas he's great uh greg's stuff is mm-hmm. great uh the wilderness first responder there are two big organizations when i did mine there was um running that stuff and yeah they're amazing training really really good to get yeah. And these are, this is, this is not inexpensive. You're going to be investing between 200 and a thousand, $1,200 for this kind of training. But if we think about some of the other things we dropped a thousand dollars on. Yeah. To, well, I mean, to know kid, what to kid, do. parents will, parents will buy their yeah. kids a thousand dollar smartphone in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Right. But then they'll yeah. balk at paying a thousand bucks to get medical treatment to keep little Johnny alive. I'm like, come on, mm-hmm. where are your priorities? Yeah, Exactly. And so having that moment where you think, what can, what am I going to do? And yep. knowing what to do yes. is, you know, like the old mask was a MasterCard ads that priceless. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, yeah, we had talked about a few talking points like, you know, this, the technique of the shoes, which if you're new to the show, this was lifted from Greg from, I almost called you Greg. Cause I'm also a big fan of Greg Elifritz's book. Oh, okay, but, cool. Um, you know, from, good. Uh, yeah, from Nick's, but from Nick's book about, yeah, when you buy new walking shoes or hiking boots, take the old ones off, they go in your trunk, and the new ones go on your feet. And that way, if your car breaks down, 
no matter what you had on your feet, you're coming back from a wedding in high heels or whatever. You've got comfortable broken in shoes with a pair of good socks in them so that 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 three mile walk to the gas station or that five mile walk to help doesn't shred your feet. Oh, uh, mate, not not yeah. three, not three, yeah. nine, eleven, <laughs> nine, eleven. They mm. some people walked more than 30 miles. Uh, the great power outage where 45 mm. million Americans and 8 million Canadians mm. were hit. Most of those people walked upwards of 20. Getting out of Manhattan back over into Jersey, yeah. it's 20 miles. Uh, we Good just Lord. looked at a week ago this shutdown, and uh, I'm just I'm doing another book, by the way. It's a, mm. I've extrapolated the piece on the bug in bag, and I wanted to expand mm. upon it. And I'm writing that book. And right as, right as I am in front of my computer, I got the news thing about the uh, iced up roads in Virginia where the highway was blocked for 20 hours. People were stuck. Yeah. Trucks had hit one. Emergency mm. vehicles couldn't get there. And people are again faced with, well, you may have to walk, right? Five miles in either direction to the off ramp to get home. What are you walking in? What are you wearing? Yeah. And, and would you prefer, about, yeah, prefer your high heels or those, your yeah. dress shoes? versus mm -hmm. the the pair of sneakers you spent a year breaking in yep. that's that's a no-brainer yep. but so that was one of the ideas in getting real medical training what are some other things that depend, that you would recommend parents do to increase their ability to protect their kids all right uh number one that i laugh at a mm -hmm. lot and i talk i talk in the book about stickers mm -hmm. on cars they did a study where they find that people with stickers on their vehicles are more likely to be guilty of road rage than people who don't have stickers on their car. And the thing that struck me about that study was it didn't matter what the stickers said. So you could have a save the whales, I'm an earth biscuit, coexist sticker ridden car. They're still more likely to in get involved in road rage. And that's the shrinks are saying it's because they ident the vehicle they look at as a part of them. So mm -hmm. if you cut their vehicle mm -hmm. off, you cut them off and now they want to kill you. But one of the things we don't think enough about stickers is what those stickers on the back of the car, you see the family, the mum and the dad stick figure with three kids mm -hmm. and a dog and a cat. And underneath we have a picture of, you know, there's a little motorbike jumping. With, so all of this stuff is telling me, and then they'll put my kids a student of, he's an honor student of this bit. So you've just told me how many children you have, where they go to school, where you go to church, where you work. Uh, that you have valuable toys in your garage that I could go and steal. You know, there's a military mm -hmm. sticker, you know, wife of a damn Marine or whatever. Okay, that tells me dad's not home all the time. There is so much information if I was a predator given to me by those stickers on the back of the car. I mean, you've done all my work for me. So I tell people, take those damn things off. You want to be what we call in bodyguard circles, the gray man. And the gray man is a term used to describe good spies. That was the guy that no one remembered. He didn't have any outstanding features. He wasn't tall. He wasn't short. He didn't have a big mole on his face. He didn't have a particularly big nose or a weird haircut, right? He just blended in. And after the party, everyone's like, do you remember that guy? And like, I don't, I don't, I can't recall him. That's a gray man. And that concept has taken over into bodyguard world where we tell ourselves, if I'm taking a client into somewhere, we want to be the gray man. We want to come in and not draw any attention to ourselves. So we get in, we do our business and we go and no one knows we're there. And too many people in America, and, and I don't know what it's like overseas, I haven't been there for a while, but here we have this trend. I drive around and they just plastered the back of their car with all this stuff that if I was a predator, God, I mean, you've given me all, like I said, you've done my work for me. I don't need to do anything else. Uh, that, Absolutely. That see, also the, see also the bumper stickers uh, along the lines of this car protected by 357. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. okay, buddy. You just told me, A, this car yeah. has stuff I might need in an emergency, and B, you have really bad offset. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, this, this, by the way, goes into another one of the points mm -hmm. I was going to make, and it came up when I was doing security. I worked real estate for a little while, and I was doing asked to do some security for our people at the office because we, real estate agents is actually a dangerous mm -hmm. profession uh, for women who are in it. There's a lot of them get targeted and attacked every year. But one of the things that struck me when I went through this home, looking at it again from the, I talk about reticular activation system in that mm -hmm. book, I'm looking at it from a, you know, security viewpoint, not a real estate agent viewpoint. And parents have, you go in the house and here's the little sign on the door, like, you know, Sarah's room. Mm -hmm. You go inside the room and there are pictures of Sarah and she's maybe at the local horse riding club, tennis club, lacrosse, soccer team, whatever. And, 
there's pictures of her at her school and pictures of her with her friend. All I have to do now is go wait at the school bus stop or go find Sarah walking somewhere, pull up and go, hey, Sarah, your mom sent me. She's at the stables with Sapphire. He tripped and broke his leg, right? I got to take you over there straight away. Now, what 12-year-old girl worrying about her pony Sapphire, right? And I've, I've said her name. I told her her mom's name. I know about the stables. I know about the horse. I know his name. What kid's not going to jump in the car and go? And I told my clients, right, take all that crap down. Take their names down. Take the pictures. Take any identifying anything, right, that they could use. And, and that, by the way, most real estate people have told their clients about taking the drugs out of the, the medicine cabinet. Uh, one ploy is drug addicts will come husband and wife team. The wife will talk to the agent downstairs, ask questions about the kitchen and the husband's walking through the house. They're hitting the medicine cabinets looking for any sort of pain mm. meds they can take. Uh, so yeah, just stuff like that. Be aware of what you're telling people inadvertently without broadcasting it. Oh, that makes really good sense. What was the name of the, the OG hacker? He wrote a book in the eighties, ended up working for the FBI. I can't, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he, from the beginning was saying that you know, only a small percentage of hacking has anything to do with the keyboard. The rest of it's calling the director of the security on the phone, phone and saying you're from, you know, yes. you're from his boss's office and he needs yep. a password today. Yeah. Social you engineering know. is huge. Hmm. And there are actually these guys who are red teams that go and test this hmm. stuff, but they have taken this to an amazing degree. I watched, uh, I was at a conference in Orlando back in the nineties and a woman was talking about it then that they would make phone calls and they'll have a tape recording of a baby crying in the background, mm. right? Which elicits a response from the woman who's on the phone on the other end that you're trying to get the information from. Mm. So she now starts crying going, my husband's not here. And then the baby starts wailing and the other kid can be heard screaming in the background. And she's like, oh, and she's getting all flustered. And the woman on the other end is listening to this and now all her defenses break down and she just wants to try and help. So yeah, they're super cunning. They're, they're, and there are books out yeah. there on how these guys do it. It's brilliant. When you look at it, you're just like, man, that's so smart. If they, if they took those smarts and applied them to non-criminal pursuits, they'd probably be wealthier than they would doing the criminal stuff. But yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's from a parent's perspective, you think about the bad guys are that sophisticated. Mm -hmm. yep. So if we think that they're not scanning the background of our teenage daughter's selfie in her bedroom yep. for information and, you know, ways to wedge themselves in, we are kidding ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Which brings up another good point, yeah. by the way. Um, this one is we just had one of our students was being mm. groomed online. Mm. Uh, I was talking to a guy out of Georgia um, America down near Atlanta, who was claiming to be 17 when they tracked the number down there, it was to a 53 year old's house. Um, and she had no idea. And we work with several, uh, trafficking organizations. And so some of the things you need to be very, very, very careful about when it comes to this. And, and, you know, this has now been exacerbated by the fact that so many kids now are stuck at home because of the pandemic, they're not getting out. So they're living on their computers. And these guys, you know, predators, I talk about it in the book, predators in the animal kingdom go to the watering hole because that's where all the game will be, right? At the end of every day. Uh, our predators attack, you know, typically tourist areas are big for getting your stuff uh, pocket picked and all that stuff. Because again, that's where the crowds are. University campus is big on rapists because there's tons of girls first time they've left home, they're naive. So they go to where these people are. Well, where are these kids? They're online. So the predators are online. And so some of the warnings, so A, get involved in what your kids are watching online. I, and I know that's tough because you can have all the controls in the world. If your kid's friend doesn't, they'll just look at their computer. But start to be aware. Um, you want to give them some warning. Here are some warning signs. Number one with girls, it's any guy over the age of 18 that's trying to arrange a date with any girl under the age of 18. That is one of the danger cross points. Yeah. Um, another thing with sex trafficking is people are unaware of is guys, boys who are, sex, who are trafficked, uh, it's massively unreported. 
And they think it's probably as bad as girls, but boys being boys don't want to talk about it. And one of the things these guys will get them, they don't even arrange this. The parents are like, well, I know where my kid is. He's in his room, right? And they think if the kid's not going down to meet someone, he's safe. No, these guys will do a thing where they will get in the video gaming world where all these boys are, right? Go where the targets are. And then they will offer to pay for this kid to get to the next level of that video game that he wants to access, right? It's like, oh, I can do that for you. Just send me a picture, all right? And so now the kid takes the picture on Snapchat or WhatsApp or whatever his thing is and sends it to that guy thinking it's innocuous. And now that guy, then they start and it gets, you know, send me another picture, send me this, I'll buy you this, I'll buy you that. They're buying him stuff online. So there's no gifts turning up at the house in an Amazon box, like who the hell is this from? They're doing this straight through the computer and the parents are totally unaware. Once they've got the hooks into the kid, it's like, I'll put this picture everywhere unless you take more pictures and now they got it. Yeah. So, you know, be very aware of that. Get involved, tell your kids what the danger signs are, ask them if anyone's been trying to do this for them and point it out. One of the uh, better pieces of advice that I've gotten from a couple other guests on the show who specialize in online and mobile device security is mm -hmm. setting the rule that here's your mobile device. It doesn't you don't use it in the bathroom. You don't use it in the bedroom. Yep. And it's and that way you can at least have a see their body language, see their facial expression there in the living room, kind of like in the '90s when the family computer was yes. there in the den, and yep. you couldn't get too get in too much trouble because dad is in the, you know, in the recliner next to you watching TV. Yep. And that little rule, although it can be kind of hard to get that genie out, you know, back in the bottle if your kids already have a phone and already use it in their rooms. Yeah. But it's a really good guideline that can help give us a little bit of an edge on that particular case. Yeah. And there's another one of those, by, by the way, um, another two points mm -hmm. I'd make on that same while we're on that yeah. subject. Number one, you can buy, I mean, I make mine with mm -hmm. duck but you can buy these little uh, cover your mm. camera mm. on your computer until you're ready to use it because these hackers now can get into the computer and look through your camera on the thing mm. and they busted I, i'm sure you're aware of this doing the show you do mm. you remember the school a couple of years ago about five years ago they gave all the kids computers to take home to do their homework mm -hmm. on and then they mm -hmm. found out that these cameras were activated on that and anyone at the school could have been looking through the camera into the girls' bedrooms. Yeah. And it was a huge, huge scandal. So get the right. kids those and tell them to cover their cameras up unless they're talking to their, you know, specific girlfriend that they've known for a long time. Another thing to be aware of, kids who are LGBTQ2 or whatever that term is, um, they are massively at risk mm -hmm. of being trafficked. Huge. Mm -hmm. All right, because they are isolated, they feel alone, they don't make mm -hmm. friends easily. Um, they're all they're they're a little weirded out. It's hard. Some of them haven't told their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, they they can't relate to the normal kids and tell them. So they get very very isolated. And the second that kid's isolated, uh, mm -hmm. it opens up a doorway for the predators to come in and get them. So they are a massive percentage of kids who are trafficked. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is kids in foster care, for mm -hmm. the same reason. All right, so if you have any children that are involved in any of that sort of stuff, watch them extra hard because uh, they are massively victimized. And a lot of things, too, that people – another thing about sex trafficking I'll mention real fast mm -hmm. that the people I work with wish more people understood was it's not all about sex either. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these kids are taken. They'll end up working in fields, um, you know, factories. They're just shipped mm -hmm. and, and put in, forced into child labor. And everyone thinks, oh, it's all about sex. It's all about sex. Not always. Well, trafficking before we, it kind of became, it's become a hot button issue, maybe a buzzword, mm -hmm. but it's existed forever. And yes. although it did include, you know, women, young women forced into prostitution, it overwhelmingly more included people brought in as immigrants in a kind of indentured servitude, almost yes. slavery vibe, even in the 20th century. Brought yeah. over, told you have to work off your, you know, you have to work off your contract, but of course the contract mm -hmm. fills in a way. And they're yeah, there we, without their passports. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they, out of the Middle East and Asia, that happens. It's still going on to this day. I mean, it goes on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my secret service buddies was involved in investigation here. He's one of my students. And uh, yeah, they caught this woman who ran a chain of restaurants and that's where she got mm -hmm. all her waitresses and servers and kitchen staff from. 
and they're never going to get out of that, you know, contract. Yeah. You, you have to pay off this stuff and then the interest rate and inflation and they're, they're, they're locked in it forever. Yeah. Very sad. And as parents, the, the headline there is that just because, for example, I'm, I have two sons, mm-hmm. I, I still need to keep an eye on that. It's not yes. just young women and teenage girls being brought in for, for prostitution. Exactly. And another thing, by the way, to point out, you know, we, we talk about, and you talk about specifically on mm. the show, look at your kids. Also take care of your your parents, the kids' mm. grandparents, because in a lot of sense, some of them are so old and they're going through dementia, they've become children again. Mm-hmm. One of the friends I have here locally, he's ex-Vietnam vet uh, SF, and his wife was at the hospital. The mum was on her deathbed, and she was over there visiting. And the mother, her mother said, you know, take that bag over there and make sure this guy gets it. And she's like, what bag? And she said, over there, don't, don't tell anyone. I don't want so-and-so to know. It's embarrassing. It turns out the crooks on social media had found her grandson who was mm. working at a car dealership. And they had called her uh, posing as a sheriff and said, listen, we've arrested Jason. Right? He's got caught with, now we know he's not a bad kid, right? He was in a car with these other guys and they had drugs in the car, but he's facing this, you know, he's going to go to prison for years. Uh, he's going to have heavy legal bills. He's never going to be able to vote. He's this, this, this. Uh, I know he's not a bad kid. So if you want to get me 10 grand, right, we can get Mm. his bail posted and get him out of here. So he's not charged. I'm going to do that for you. Mm. And and she's like, absolutely, absolutely. She'd gone down and cleaned out her accounts at the bank, put it all in a bag that this guy was going to come and pick up. And luckily Mm. my friend's wife was suspicious, called him, got the story out of her, called the grandson, right? And he's like, no, I'm at work. I'm not locked up. I haven't been locked up. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. She had 10 grand of her life savings in this bag ready to go. And that happened. Yeah. Oh, it's another one of those social engineering schemes, right? Mm-hmm. And again, this brings us back to social media. It's a double-edged sword. There is so much information you can glean if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. And especially... And a lot of us focus on the information our kids are giving away, mm-hmm. but also paying attention to what we're giving away, whether that's yep. something as simple as texting, hey, good luck, honey, at the cheerleading mm-hmm. finals in two towns over, yep. we'll see in two days, you know, that, and yep. then they can look up that the finals last three days. So the unsupervised girl yep. is now in a hotel. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, and just making sure that information is denied to any potential bad guys. And that's another good one on social media. Don't tell people where you're going, tell them where Mm -hmm. you've been. Mm -hmm. I see people all the time. Oh, we're packing for our trip. It's going to be so great. We're going to Bora Bora for two weeks. And again, Mm -hmm. you've just told people who will, and again, God, I get a thousand requests a a week for friends on Facebook and I won't, Mm -hmm. I won't let them be my friends. If I don't know them, if we don't Mm -hmm. have 25 mutual friends already, and then I'll still call my existing friend and go, hey, this guy, how do you know him? And he goes, man, I met him at a seminar. He's a cool guy, right? I'll do it. If he goes, oh, I don't know. He just befriended me. I'm checking all the time who's on my profile. Most kids are so big on how many followers they can get. Mm-hmm. They will let absolutely anyone follow them. And now you're telling people, so cool, my parents are taking us to Disney for two weeks. Right, and you've just told everybody, home's going to be empty for two weeks or we're going to be here and you can target us because we're staying in a hotel. Mm-hmm. You tell them when you come back, hey, check out the cool photos. We were just at Disney for two weeks, right? Don't say that mm-hmm. before you go. It's just OPSEC again. Absolutely. And from a, and that, that'll protect your stuff, but that is also important for protecting yourself because if you're taking mm-hmm. your kids to Thailand and yep. you're posting photos even at the end of each day, there uh-huh. are people in Thailand who are washing the hashtags yep. and then they know your itinerary. Uh-huh. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think one thing that a lot of people in North America don't fully grasp is that any family that can go on vacation to Thailand, to Poland, right. to Brazil is unfathomably wealthy by yes. the standards of their destination. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. I talk about that in the book that they don't realize 
that you know five hundred dollar camera you've got around your neck can be six months worth of income for mm-hmm. someone in a third world country. And they yeah. look at you, you now they have as much empathy for you as you would eating a hamburger and looking at it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They just look at you as a resource and away they go. And people don't understand that. And the other thing is then they'll fight for that camera and get stabbed three times. Cultural mm-hmm. differences again, right? Dan in Asanto pointed that seminar years ago we said 80 percent of the world fights with knives you know we we don't australia doesn't france doesn't right england doesn't canada doesn't because of the marquee of queensbury but we have these open borders where we let and invite other cultures to come in but we don't sort of debrief them like guys we don't do that we use our fists and all of a sudden you know knives now look at england right knife attack everywhere and so that guy the you know north american Vanilla white average family guy goes down to Mexico or somewhere on vacation with his family. And then they try and snatch his wife's bag and he goes to fight for it and gets stabbed a bunch of times and and sits there sort of in shock and horror as he's bleeding out on the sidewalk going, what just happened? Yeah. Yeah, You have to be, have to be aware of all of that stuff. Of that. I had a experience a few years back. I took my boys and we lived in Malaysia for a year just so that they had, could have the experience of living somewhere that wasn't North America. Very And we were going, it, it was a really cool experience for them. And yeah. uh, we were going through through the airport just there at one of the regional airports. Mm-hmm. And the I had forgotten I had a little rinky-dink Swiss Army knife in the first aid kit. Yeah, And it buzzed and it took it out. And I'm like, you know, and to us, it's, you know, this is a $15 Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Like, you know what? Just just keep it. Just keep it. And the guy, and I could tell from his body language, it's like, yeah, that that small thing that was literally a forgettable component in our kit in our yeah, EDC yep. was yep. enough to you know he could have sold it for for yep. meals for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I'm glad I heard you say that about your kids. I have I've had a theory for years. I wish every single American family would pack their kids off at age 16 or 17. Like you have to go to a third world country for 12 months. The government should have a policy. You have to go, you have to leave for 12. We'll pay it. We'll put you on a military transport. We're going to dump you in some third world country for 12 months and then come back and watch them kiss the tarmac when they get home and realize what they have here. When I hear these 16 and 17 year olds bitching about, and, and I've lived in places that are horrific and I've worked in places that are horrific and I look at these kids over here bitching. I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. you got no idea. You have yeah. no idea. No. You know, we had a really good time and we're fairly insulated. And, in, you know, in a, we're in Malacca, a fairly major mm-hmm. city. But to this day, the oldest, who turned 15 while we were there, he'll still mention how much he likes not having to boil his water before drinking it. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah, it's the little things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So what are some other things that we could do that as parents, we can step up our game or start instituting? Oh, mate. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, You know, the military Mm -hmm. is really big on running drills all the time Mm -hmm. about what happens when things go wrong. And I don't see enough families doing that, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, If there's a house fire, people die every year in house fires, right? When's the last time you ran a fire drill? Mm -hmm. Right. Run one. Do it. Have a have a little checklist on the fridge. Once a year, we're going to do the drill. Yeah. Like mom's a pain in the butt. Every year she makes us do this crazy drill. But one day you're going to be thankful for that. If there's a house fire. Another thing I see with that. This came from the bouncing world. I had a dear sweet friend of mine. His wife was absolutely beautiful, but she was dumb as a rock. And her kid had gone to school and had a project like what would you do in the event of a fire at the home, right? And she was giving him the advice and she's talking to me about it. And she said, yeah, we, we, we've arranged to meet in the kitchen, right? In the house fire. That's where everyone has to come to. And I'm like, you know, I think it's 80% of home fires start mm-hmm. in the kitchen. <laughs> probably, probably not the place to go. And uh, it got me thinking about a bouncing trick. Every time I've trained bouncers or gone bouncing, I'm like, where's our emergency RV point? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, we have a power outage at the club or there's a panic or, a, and we've had it, right? City block got lit up, I had a drunk driver hit a, uh, what the power, the local power box or whatever it was. And the whole block shut down. And you've got 800 people who are dancing and all of a sudden all the lights go out, right? And people start screaming and then someone gets grabbed, they're yelling and the panic starts. 
and all that club catches fire. We have that a lot. Nightclubs catch mm -hmm. on fire because of the pyrotechnics inside. And I get the bouncers outside and the fire guy's there and he's like, did all your team get out? Right. Well, there's six bouncers and there's five of us. Where's, you know, Steve, right? We don't know. Is he inside? Do they need to send someone in to try and find him? Or is he out on the other side of the building somewhere in the parking lot? And this is true of active shooters. It's true of a lot of things, right? Have an emergency RV point outside of your home. And you should have two. You should have one near the house, right? Which is across the street in the front yard of the neighbors or at the corner of this particular street junction at the bus stop, whatever it is. So everyone gets there and now you know you're all outside. You should have another one further away from home. So if you think of something like Katrina where... The storm is coming. The sun is going to fly down to Katrina to try and help mum. The plane gets delayed. The mother has to evacuate mm -hmm. because the floodwaters are rising and they grab her and take her and drop her. And now they have no way of connecting with one another. So you should have another emergency RV point further away. And it might be, you know, another town, the next town over. It doesn't matter. Somewhere that if you're not at the primary rendezvous point, I go to the secondary rendezvous point and look for you. And that saves, you see all this stuff now on social media. Hey, I'm marking myself safe from the earthquake that was whatever. Well, you wouldn't have to waste time doing that. You'd go and find the person at the secondary RV point. So set those up for your kids. And I liked your point. I saw one of your posts on Instagram about making this stuff a game for the younger kids. Mm. You don't want to freak them out, right? And you literally do that, right? It's like a game of hide and seek. Hey, I'm not here. Then go and find me in this place and set that up. Mm. I think that is missing in a lot of uh, stuff that I see for people. When I'm talking mm. to them, I, I, I ask them questions like this. No, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Uh, another one that's in my book that, again, I'm struck by the amount of people that don't know it. We have had incidences now a lot in this country where people are driving and they drive, you know, because as Americans, again, they spend so much time in their vehicles. And I point in the book, mm. 80% of attacks on clients in the bodyguard industry are when they're in their vehicles because it's pretty easy to secure the residence and the workplace, but the vehicle is always an issue. Uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time out driving. If you were unlucky enough to drive into one of these, they block the highway off and they're doing a protest. Most of those things end up getting resolved. You know, after a while of standing out in the burning sun with no, they lose interest and they, they eventually let everyone go. But every now and then we see... You know, the guy tries to push through the crowd and next minute it turns violent. That mob mentality sets in and they're breaking car windows and dragging people out and beating them. A simple trick is drop your car windows a quarter of an inch all the way around, which is easy now. You don't have to manually wind them anymore. Drop them a quarter of an inch because the windows are stronger in that position than they are if they're all the way up. Have some blankets in the car that you can throw over the kids, especially if they're very young. You don't want to scar them emotionally by letting them watch what's going on outside and they're picking up on your being afraid and looking at windows broken and people being dragged out and kicked. Mm -hmm. Throw the kid on the back seat of the car and put the blanket over him. Can make a game out of that, right? Heidi time, stick the kid under the blanket. And that way, if a window did get broken, the glass flying in mm -hmm. or anything coming in from outside stands a chance of not hitting the child. Uh, so, yeah, simple things like that. If you've got the bug-in bag in your car, which I hope everyone does, not enough people factor in what if you have a pet and what if you have children. They should have their own little bug-in bags mm -hmm. with stuff that, you know, you want. You don't want to be scrabbling around with the family dog and there's no leash in the car or there's no collar. Um, mm -hmm. And you're going to try and walk five miles to the next exit <laughs> ramp or something. Have a collar, have a leash, have a bag for the kid, mm -hmm. have their stuff in it. Again, make a game out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't forget the biannual checks of those things. People mm -hmm. make those things. They're all excited. They throw it in the trunk of the car and that's the last time they look for it until they need it. And then seven years later, they're pulling this thing out. All the cliff bars have passed. They're used by date. The water's stale. The shoes no longer fit. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong season. You packed it for summer. Now it's winter, right? Twice a year, you want to go through the bag, uh, check the ex expiration date on all your medical stuff that's in there, any of the protein bars and so on, freshen up the water. Anything, anything basically that's got to use by date, switch it out and change it seasonally and also based on where you're going. If I'm going to ride my motorbike up through North America, I pack a different bag on the back of that bike than I do when I'm riding through the South in the middle of the summer. 
And mm. enough, again, a lot of people have got the concept of I've got some emergency supplies in the car, but they don't factor in, you know, weather, climate, and where they are geographically. Mm. Yeah. And that's, I think you hit on something that I think is very valuable that I know professional teams do and professionals in all kinds of uh, well, professions, careers, industries mm. do, which is have that kind of checklist where if you have a checklist of, okay, yes. twice a year, we're going to go through the bug out bags. Mm-hmm. Once a year, we're going to restock the first aid kit. We're going to do our fire drill once, you know, yep. once now, once then, and just, and have that list, make one for your family. And then when you sit down to do your calendar, you know, in, in January, when the old one comes off the wall, the new one comes on the wall, yeah. if we're still doing it physically, then we put those right in there. Cause anything that we don't write down, we tend to forget anything we yeah, don't prioritize and, and, by getting it on the this, calendar. It doesn't happen. It comes back to another point I made in the book about you look at the amount of preparation people will do when they're going on a vacation Mm-hmm. And they will research the weather, the hotel, the price of the room, the view from the window, how far is it from the airport to the hotel, and do we want to walk? And is the hotel within walking distance of the McDonald's and the ice cream shop? And they spend all this time researching all of that stuff, and they don't look at the crime rate. They don't mm-hmm. look at any of the stuff for their security. They just look at this. And mums are really good at making lists. Go and ask any mother right? Where's the list for packing for vacation or getting your kids ready for school, right? And I watch them every time school starts, they're in the local Staples office depot with a checklist. You've got to have three of these books, two of these pens, four highlighters, batteries for this, a ruler, a calculator, a drawing kit, a crayon, a box of this, blah, blah, blah. Set those up for your safety and security. Have one of those lists, Mm -hmm. you know, at this time every year, we're going to pull the yeah, a good time to do this, by the way, is when the uh, the fire department wants you to change the batteries and you're smoking mm-hmm. oxide detectors, right? That would be a great day to sit there and go, that's security day, all right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to change the batteries in this. I'm going to change the code on the alarm. I'm going to change the locks on the thing because we've handed those out to a couple of contractors. Um, now we're going to go through the bugging bag and replace anything and, and all the season's mm-hmm. changing. So we're going to put our winter stuff in there. That's the perfect time to do that. Because now it acts as a little reminder, right? Oh, yeah, that's the day we pull the bags out and go through everything. Yeah. So on spring forward day and fall back day every year, we'll just spend that yep. Sunday doing the thing. Yeah, there you that, go. That makes good sense. Yep. Excellent. Um, Mr. Hughes, I know you're incredibly busy, and I really appreciate the time you've taken today. Before I let you go, though, is there a topic that you don't get enough chance to talk about? No. I. The only mm-hmm. thing is... I get a lot of the guys in the martial arts industry that want to talk Mm. about the fighting techniques and Mm. my big thing, the direction I have gone in the last, you know, since writing the first edition of the book is I finally woke up to the fact that self-defense and martial arts are two different Mm. animals. And a lot of martial artists don't understand that, that, Mm. and, and I like this, I saw a guy on Instagram do this and I said, I'd steal it from him. So here I go. The self-defense pie, right? One slice of that is how to fight. Should it get to that point? But there's all these other things we're talking about. Rendezvous points, learning first Mm -hmm. aid, telling your kids not to get picked up by someone that they have to fight their way out of the back of their car, all right? Not to get roofied so they wake up somewhere where they're restrained and they have to learn to break out, right? We're back into the hard skill learn those soft skills and that fighting is just one slice of that Mm -hmm. and i don't think enough people in the industry understand that concept uh rich dimitri's doing some good stuff now i don't agree 100 percent with what he says because which is a good thing right i'm very fond of the saying that if two people agree on absolutely everything then one of those people isn't necessary (laughs) <laughs> but he's making some very valid points that a lot of self-defense mm-hmm. is not, you know, throat punching someone or kicking someone in the groin that mm-hmm. a lot of women who become victims, they know that they know their attacker. Mm-hmm. So we have, you know, the abuse in the home. We have the uncle that's molesting the child. Uh, you know, you have the, the guys in the churches they've caught scouting groups. They've caught molesting the kids. Mm-hmm. That it's not always, you know, jumping, spinning wheel kicks are going to save the day. It's recognizing those signals and learning how to control and deal with that inside that environment where the person is known to them. 
So yeah, I just think too many too many people get into it yeah. and they want to learn the Jackie Chan on six cups of coffee mm-hmm. jumping around, which is cool. And you should know that, all right? Yeah. But we neglect a lot of the soft skills. And I think it was Sun Tzu that said the best way to win the fight is not have one. Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've, more- I've occasionally said that every story you tell the Denzel, so I kick that guy's ass is a story that started mm-hmm. with screwing up a perfectly good de-escalation plan. There you go. Uh, you know, yep. um, it's in some ways the martial arts study in particular is like, what was that quote by Eisenhower about how plans are useless, but planning is essential. Yes. Well, if you train in martial arts and degree it and build a degree of proficiency, the way that you walk, the way that you move and the confidence mm-hmm. that gives you, takes you off of a lot of predators radars because yes, it they does. are they're cowardly poltroons but they're good at their jobs and they're not gonna they're not gonna go for the person who looks like they can handle themselves what was, what was that study there was that the uh, grayson grayson stein there it is it was very they cool. just identified mm-hmm. yeah. 100, pe- 100 people walking mm-hmm. down the road they showed the film to human predators in two different prison systems and they picked 98 percent of them picked the same victims yeah. And the, the thing that struck us was not, you know, oh, well, they all picked little girls or weakling looking mm-hmm. guys. No, they picked some big looking dudes and they ignored some mm-hmm. women and it all came back to how they carry themselves. This is one of the things that frustrates me about the bullying. The anti-bullying stuff being done mm-hmm. is horrible. Mm-hmm. Schools have a lot to answer for. This zero tolerance policy where you're denying a child the right to self-defense. That's what that's saying. Your kid does not have a right to defend himself. He can be attacked by two guys in the bathroom, but if he throws a punch at one of them, right, we're going to kick him out of school. That's like me telling you, right, two guys break into your home and you hit one of them, you're going to go to prison as well because we have a zero tolerance. You're all three of you are going to jail, all right? That's BS. Uh, so we have this bullying thing and then the, they go on about, oh, we're going to wear pink T-shirts and make everyone aware of it. Oh, we've got a puppet show showing, you know, the bullies, how wrong they are. And then they brag that they've reduced bullying by 20% in their school, right? No. And the parents take the kid from the school and put him in another school. And we all know what happens. Within a month, he's being bullied at the new school. You could put that kid in 100 schools. He's just going to keep getting bullied. You Because you have not changed the way he carries himself. And that ties into something brilliant about the military. What is the first thing they do when they get those screaming neophytes off that bus at four o'clock in the morning, right? They've painted footprints to put your feet in. And then they start the the first couple of weeks of screaming at you, get your shoulders back, lift your chest up, tuck your chin in, look at me, do this, how you stand. And then they start you marching, right? And what what is the underlying science behind all of that? It's how you carry yourself, Mm -hmm. Right? You've gone from the slumped, rounded shoulders, looking at the floor, not projecting your voice to, sir, yeah, sir, and shoulders back and chest up. Mm-hmm. And parents talk about how they go to graduation at the military and how they don't recognize their children. Like, God damn, what did you do to him? Right. But the first thing the military teaches you is how you carry yourself. Before they teach you to shoot a gun, before they teach you to parachute or anything else, right? They teach you how to carry yourself. And that study points that out brilliantly. Another thing I mentioned in the new book and not the old one, there has been a subsequent study in England on where does bullying stop? Because a lot of us think, well, it's bullying in school, right? And then you you finally grow up, you're 16, 17, you go out in the workplace and school's behind you now and we're all growing up and we don't see that. No, there's five books in my local bookstore on bullying in the workplace. They have just done this study in England where they found out that the kids who were bullied in school are more likely to be victims of bullying in the workplace. They're more likely to be overweight, suffer from low self-esteem, have gone through multiple jobs, be picked on at work, all right, and be the victims of crimes of rape and assault and beatings and everything else. Hmm. So at some point, if you're not addressing that, right, this is going to follow you. The bullying, the kids who are bullied are going to be dealing with this their entire lives. All right. At some point, we have to figure out, get your kids some training, intervene in that and stop it. Yeah. If, if you really care about them, otherwise they're going to take this forever. And some of the some of the research I've seen coming out of the last four or five years, you know, mm. we're both preaching to the choir about get your kids in some martial arts classes. Yes. But it's and martial arts is an extremely effective way of doing this. But it seems like kids who get one thing just one thing and that could be martial arts could be sports could be music could be drama could be chess could be lego engineering whatever it is one thing to be good at and proud of 
where they can yes. spend other time with people who value being good at that thing. Yes. They just need the one thing and it yep. exponentially reduces their chances of being bullied and victimized as adults. Yep. Absolutely. Right. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. And folks do pick up the new edition. We'll make sure to put the announcement. This is one of my top 10 uh, safety books for parents. We okay. are, by the way, um, if I can do a shameless plug, there is Absolutely. also the audio book is coming out because mm. I know a lot of people don't like reading. We have the app is coming out that's being built as you and I are talking about this, which is great mm. because now you don't have to read and memorize the book because people mm. are going, man, there's 500 tips in there. How am I going to? Now you'll just have it on your phone mm. and you're about to climb on a plane and fly to Disney. You open up the airplane section. And there's all the stuff about going through the airport. You're checking into the hotel. You open up the hotel section and all the little tips are laid out for you. And we're building the online course. We're halfway through filming mm. and uploading that. So you will be able to go on and watch us as we check in, fly, drive, all that stuff. Uh, and we'll take you through all the stuff. So that is that is Fabulous. also, yeah. Excellent. And folks, we'll make sure to watch, uh, watch Mr. Hughes' channel on Instagram over on Facebook for that information. I'll be sure to put the news on our, our feeds as well. So thank you again. And Man, thank you everybody pleasure. for thank watching. You. And be safe, everyone. We'll see you next time. Cool.